We're about to start the next presentation, which is called Accounting for Cryptocurrency, Transactions, Tracking, and Tax, everybody's favorite. So our next teacher I'm really excited about. Uh, this is someone that I have known for a while in the crypto space. He's a, a sought after speaker, regularly teaches uh, CPAs and attorneys about blockchain and cryptocurrencies and accounting and tax questions. He was one of the earliest people to start exploring this field. He's known as the Bitcoin CPA, the Bitcoin CPA. <laughs> he is the author of the Ultimate Bitcoin Business Guide, which also has an audiobook that's narrated by me, just saying. And he's got bylines at Why Bitcoin, Bitcoin Magazine, and Coindesk. He's a member of the AICPA Virtual Currency Task Force. He is one of the first people to earn his certified Bitcoin professional and was the first CPA to accept Bitcoin back in 2014. So uh, also one more thing, founder of CryptoProResource.com, a resource for accounting, audit, and finance professionals. Make sure you connect with him there. And he's gonna be around the conference too to answer any questions that we don't get to in this talk. So without further ado, it is my great, great pleasure to introduce your speaker, Kirk Phillips. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody can hear me okay? I forgot the wave that we were starting. So yes, I'm very excited to be here today at Blockchain Training Conference talking about accounting for cryptocurrencies, transactions, tracking, and tax, which may seem like this is an uninteresting topic. However, I, of course, find it fascinating. And uh, for you, those of you who are either already crypto enthusiasts or you're getting into it for the first time, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, lot of nuggets here. So the intention was to kind of make this uh, valuable information for a, a wider range of folks, but try to keep it kind of, you know, simple at the same time. And it's really probably about an hour and a half, or if you guys are really engaged, I mean, this could be something we could, you know, talk about for an hour and a half, two hours, and we've only got 50 minutes to do it, so I'm going to do my best to blow through it. Sometimes I tend to talk fast when I do that, but uh, if you guys want to, if you have a question, you can certainly answer that during as we go along, but if there's, you know, some type of extended question or inquiry you want to have, I'm around for a couple hours after this before I have to take off, so I'd be glad to give you whatever time you need if you wanted a more in-depth discussion on anything. So let's see, without further ado, and thank you, Stephanie, for the introduction. So it's uh, interesting we've come full circle because, as she says, she's an amazing uh, voice artist, and she did the audiobook for the Ultimate Bitcoin Business Guide, and uh, it was great work. Can't wait to actually work with her again on other projects. That's just the, as you've seen before, the uh, little snippet for the conference. This one thing is there, uh, that's, my, that's my handle there that I've been using and just, you know, speaking about the book. But this one quick story on that is because everybody wants to know, well, how'd you get into this and how you, how'd you get started? So somewhere around Jan 1, 2014, uh, uh, an acquaintance asked me, hey, do you know about Bitcoin? You know, my husband and I want to buy a computer for $1,000 and mine said Bitcoin and make some money. What do you think about that? So my skeptical mind was like, you don't know what you're talking about. You better go get your facts straight, right? But what I really said was, well, I don't know anything about it. I'll get back to you. And anyway, that's how I ended up going down the rabbit hole. Spent two years writing that book, and that's all she wrote. Here we are today. And that's morphed into all kinds of other things. So that's the background story. So isn't it interesting? You guys heard Andreas talk about the importance of education. That was a kind of an underlying theme in the opening uh, talk this morning, right? So that's one of the things I always like to point out as well. So here's a famous quote if anybody's seen this before, by Walter Riston, former uh, Citigroup chairman and CEO, and he said that information about money ha has become almost more important than money itself. And I like that statement because I've, I've just kind of repurposed it, and I say information about cryptocurrencies is more important than crypto itself. Not almost, like in the previous slide, it was almost. I say it is more important because, uh, as many of you may know, you've got a lot of risk. You've got, you know, monetary sovereignty now. You can be 100% responsible for your own assets. So with that, you know, it comes a lot of extra effort that you got to make sure that you could, you know, you don't basically step on a landmine and blow yourself up at some future point. So education is hugely, hugely critical in here, more valuable than the crypto. So just starting with some uh, basic stuff here. So again, this is really looking at this whole subject from both an individual perspective 
and you know, a person in the capacity as an individual and also that of a business. It's kind of like looking at both of those and since I always think about things from a business level, of course I've got to include that and I'm sure many of you are part of a business, have your own business or whatever the case is. So the accounting, I just wanted to talk about this to really kind of demystify accounting for anybody that doesn't have an accounting background. It's like, oh, that accounting stuff. So I just wanted to oversimplify some stuff that helps in the understanding of future slides that I'm going to talk about. So the accounting equation is basically A equals L plus E, right? And that's A is for assets, L is for liabilities, E is for equity. And all that is is think about it like a little, a little balancing scale. Like I know my grandmother had one of those little old scales where you had the little weights, right? And you put the little weight on one side and you balance it out with the thing on the other side. That's kind of the metaphor for this. Everything has to be in balance at all times. So the A side is one side of the scale and the L and the E side is the other side of the scale, right? And those always have to be in balance. Same thing for journal entries, because I'm gonna show you some journal entries. Every journal entry has to balance at the same time. It's like you're conducting a transaction, you need to record a transaction, you gotta put both sides of the equation on the scale and have that balance out. So the ac accumulation and the amalgamation of all the journal entries throughout the course of a year, you know, if it's a one year period of time for a business, if you add all those together, in theory it's gonna balance. That's actually the balance sheet, by the way, too. A equals L plus E, that's the balance sheet. And so if all your journal entries are in balance, that means in theory your balance sheet is going to balance because every time you make an entry, it's in balance. So the thing here is that cryptocurrency accounting is unique in the sense that it's what I call a simultaneous parallel transaction a phenomenon that happens. So you have kind of the, on the, in the fiat world, you kind of have to record that as you normally would, as if you were using USD or whatever fiat currency, and then parallel to that, you got this whole crypto accounting that goes on beside it. So you've got these two rails that are happening simultaneously with each other, and that's what creates a lot of the, uh, a lot of the complicated nature of this and the, uh, you know, a lot of the extra work that it takes to actually do proper accounting. Uh, so, and by the way, just one thing back on this, because everybody always wants to know, I've had this question actually come up earlier today. So people might say, oh, well, you just, you just got done saying how amazing the Bitcoin blockchain is. It's got this immutable, it's immutable ledger, like we've never had before. Properties of immutability, I like, and accounting is a ledger. Accounting is about a ledger, so why, is, why would you say that, you know, accounting is, like, I would actually have to say it's really a bit of a nightmare if I had to have one word to sum it up, but that's from my point of view, right? So you would say, well, why is that, how is that possible? If it's got this amazing immutable ledger and accounting is a ledger, why, isn't, why is the accounting a nightmare? Well, the simple answer is the blockchain is actually, or the Bitcoin blockchain, just to use that for an example, it's actually great at what it does, but it's only one side of the journal entry, and it's gonna, you're going to see what I mean about that as we go along. So what it's doing, it does a great job about transferring the ownership of an asset. You can call it the cash, or in this case, it's the Bitcoin, right? Or whatever other crypto asset. It transfers that around, but that's only one side of the journal entry. So going back to the scale example, it's like you got Bitcoin on one side, now the scale's out of balance. It's like, okay, well, what happened on the other side, right? So let's say you got paid a thousand dollars in Bitcoin, put that on one side of the scale. It's like, all right, well, where did it come from? What was it for? Was it sales? Was it revenue for services? Was it a thousand dollar loan? Was it an owner equity contribution? So you got to put what is the other part of the equation on the other side of the scale, then it balances. So I'd be surprised if anybody hadn't heard about this now, unless it's really your first foray into uh, crypto accounting, but this is the old IRS notice from 2014. But I figure we got to start here again and build up from that. And so basically, we're five, six years down the road, and we have, again, no additional guidance, even though we've had the AICPA has been asking for additional guidance, the American uh, Bar Association, and on and on and on. We still have no guidance, even though the commissioners claim that there was going to be some forthcoming, and now we're still in August. So it would be good to actually come out now before, because the corporate deadline is 9.15 and the individual deadline is 10.15. So it would be good to have some more guidance. But essentially, um, the reason that, so what that basically says is that uh, crypto is taxed as property. So you've heard that. Well, the question is, why, how did they come up with that? So the logic is, is that there can only be one legal tender, which is, in the case of the U.S., the United States dollar. There can only be one legal, ten legal tender. And because there can only be one legal tender, that's to the exclusion of all others, so that means crypto, you can't have a second legal tender and a third legal tender. So basically it defaults all cryptocurrency into property status. In which case, as you know, we got, you know, this happens all the time. 
So it's going like that. So that means when you're using it for a medium of exchange or anytime you exchange it for anything, you got to compute a gain and loss on that. And if you think about the US dollar is actually kind of going along like this, it's really not at par, but we think about it as being at par. So there's, no, there's none of this, so there is no gain on that. But when it comes to these, you know, we, we know about the volatility and the up and down, so that's what creates the capital gain and loss. So this is what I call the coffee problem, which is that if you lived in a, uh, operated in a 100% cryptocurrency universe, whether it was for your business or yourself, so in other words, you conducted every transaction in cryptocurrency, right? You'd have, a, you'd have the uh, challenge of calculating gain or loss on every single transaction, right? So uh, now this is a similar, uh, similar treatment basically in other jurisdictions outside the U.S., although this is kind of a U.S.-centric focused uh, talk here. So what you, what you have to do is that what, whatever that timestamp is on a transaction, so the time and date of the transaction, you've got to make a USD translation. So what was the value at that point in time multiplied by the number of coins, and that equals you know, the value of the transaction at that particular time. So um, basically you're converting crypto into the reporting currency. The reason you use reporting currency is because you have to create financial statements and also tax returns and other compliance has to be prepared in the reporting currency. So that's another reason that you have to make the translation into USD because you don't, you don't prepare tax returns you know, with a basis uh, you know, in Bitcoin. You don't prepare financial statements using Bitcoin as a reporting currency. And first of all, it would skew the financial statements anyway. They wouldn't be, it wouldn't be you know, reliable information. So that's why you also have to make that translation. And then that is what you would uh, record in your accounting system. So I'm going to go through a few salient points of taxation. So tax treatment is akin to trading security. So even though we talk about its property, which is the same as, you know, having bought a piece of real estate and sold that, same thing with equipment. You got equipment, and then you later on sell that. So, but also, I think it's most similar, though, to the behavior that people engage in when it comes to trading securities. So people have, you know, your, your self-service TD Ameritrade accounts of the world and all that kind of stuff, and you go in there and, you, you know, you trade mutual funds, stocks, bonds, and all that kind of stuff. So the activity that actually happens there, crypto trading is very, very similar to what happens on that side. So that's another way to look at it, even though securities aren't considered property, but the way it's treated is the same. In other words, you have a basis is what you bought something for, essentially. And then you have later on when it's sold, or there's another transaction, you know, again, up and down, was either a gain or a loss at a later point in time. So we, we calculate gains and losses on, on securities, you know, that's the same as we do for, uh, for crypto. So again, you know, long term is more than a year, short term is less than a year. Now the reason people want long term is because it has the most favorable tax rates. It's actually the best tax rate you can get, essentially. It's got the lowest rate of all the different kinds of buckets of income that you can have. So if it's short term, that just means it goes in the general bucket, which has essentially the highest tax rate with your other income, like your W-2 income and stuff like that. So if it's short term, it simply goes in the general bucket, which is have the highest or higher tax rate. Long term has the lowest tax rate, so everybody's incentivized and would love to have all their crypto gains be long term because you have a lower tax liability. So here's probably one of the top uh, three or four uh, takeaways here from the talk is the consistency principle, which is like an accounting principle, kind of like a fundamental uh, principle in accounting to follow as like a guiding light, if you will, when you're doing anything with accounting. Now, I love the consistency principle because I think it's a principle that can apply to actually everything in life. It, you do. it does not just business, but actually everything in life. But, you know, that's another story. But so consistency is just about picking an approach and continuing to do that same approach over and over and again from one period to the next. So you're always doing everything consistently. If you do that, even, even though we're navigating a, sea, a murky sea, you know, there's fog out there, it's a murky sea, we don't have guidance and people are asking for guidance and they don't have it. The best way to navigate those murky seas is to do things consistently. You should have a basis for why you did, did it consistently, of course, but you know, have a basis for it and then apply it consistently. That's gonna be the single most valuable thing that you can do if you ever get called out on something, right? So consistency is real big, and that's same with uh, you know, spot price, uh, you know, price source, cost basis, methods, estimations, all that stuff. You want to be consistent in everywhere that there's uh, the opportunity to, to be consistent. So every virtual currency transaction has a basis event. So uh, even if no capital gains or losses are triggered. So basis, again, is, is it is, it's more of a fancy word, but it uh, can mean 
uh, it can mean other things, but basically just think of basis again is what you bought it for, right? So, uh, so every, every transaction has a basis event. So just using an example, XYZ company receives $5,000 BTC for services. So they record $5,000 in revenue, and now they have a $5,000 basis in the Bitcoin. Now there was no gain and loss on that transaction, but because you recognize $5,000 in, in uh, income, that's now also simultaneously the basis. So that's your parallel transactions that are going on there that I talk about, right? That parallel transactional phenomenon. So, uh, and then a, let's say, so later on, XYZ pays a vendor $2,000 in BT for marketing services. So the basis in the BTC, again, this is all just, you know, made up example here, but the basis is $1,700. XYZ is going to record a $300 gain on that transaction. So, okay, so moving on here. You guys got your computers out. If you guys go to CoinMarketCap, Dot com real quick if you go go there and then click on ethereum which is number two on that list click on it so go to coinmarketcap.com click on ethereum and it'll bring up the chart for ethereum ether so i want somebody to tell me what is the uh what was the uh, value of uh ether on 7119 it's, it's going to be on the right-hand side of the chart because I think it actually defaults to, you know, don't, get, don't pick up the 7-1-2018. I think it's over on the right, 7-1-2019. Can anybody tell me what the value is? You just got to mouse over the graph, and then the, the, the value will pop up for a given day. Who said that? I'm going give to you, give you a book. I got one book. All right, 293. So, uh, so how much would you record in USD then? This is, you got paid 34.89 Ether. How much would you record in sales for that transaction? How much is it? <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. I should have should have had the book out. All right, that sounds right. I only got one. That's the, that's the only one I can hand out. All right. So ten thousand dollars and change. That's what you record. How much is it worth right now? What's the price right now? One. How much? One seventy. Okay. Now, that, that's on CoinMarketCap. Of course, if you go to any of the other similar sites or if you click on the Coindesk, Coindesk app, which displays Bitcoin and Ethereum next to the news thing, you would see that's going to have a different price for Ethereum, of course. So um, now what's interesting, if you were to go down and you got a tab there on Ethereum where you have the chart, you have a tab that says historical prices. If you were to scroll down on that for 7-1-2019, you'll see it lists four numbers. And that's the high, the low, and the open and close, even though the sun never sets on the cryptocurrency markets, which is very unique, other, unlike other markets that are more like business hours. Sun never sets on the cryptocurrency markets, and there's no single price. There's a representation of a price, but there's no one you know, go-to price that represents any of the cryptocurrencies at any one point in time. There's indexes and things that will tell you what's you know, representative of the price, but you got multiple prices all over the place. They're going to be similar most of the time, but they're not exactly the same. So that's an extremely unique situation you have in cryptocurrencies. You just don't have that in securities. You basically have one market, you know exactly what the price is. You don't have that phenomenon. So what's interesting, so again, talking about consistency, so you could say, okay, you, you are going to have a case where you still need to look stuff up manually, even if you're using software, right? So you might say, okay, well, I'm going to use the average of the high and the low or the average of the open and close. But if you pick that to use it, again, consistently apply that every time you use that. And that's, so that's an example of, uh, you know, applying the consistency principle. So um, to back to uh, this, you know, taking the, the previous example, now putting that in journal entry form. Journal entry for the revenue. Again, we're just saying it was 8119 so you got paid $5,000. And this is, this, is, this is actually the fiat example, okay? So same, same scenario, except you got paid in USD. So again, $5,000 in sales, that's a credit. Uh, $5,000 in crash, that's a debit. Forget about debits and credits. Just think about it as left and right. That's all it is. One side of the scale and the other side of the scale. That's all it is. You gotta, scale's got to balance. And so you would have that entry. Then later on 815 is when you then, you know, 
acquire your marketing services for 2000 so cash is out, credit, marketing, a debit, expense. Again, forget about debit and credit. Is it left and right? Is this one side of the scale and the other? It's just got to balance. So that's what the fiat would look like. Now, now we're on to looking at parallel accounting in the crypto example. So the first part looks similar because you're still going to record sales for 5000 right? And now you have, instead of cash, you've got BTC that's five, worth $5,000 when you got it. So the memo entry, which is the parallel, other parallel side, is BTC basis for 5,000, and again, it's just a made-up number, but it's, you know, 0.4358 uh, Bitcoin. So now we got to record the, uh, now that's the uh, income side on the crypto. Now we're going to look at the crypto piece here when you are then, you know, you got your marketing services. So marketing for 2,000, BTC was 2,000 because that was the fair market value of it. Now the other parallel side of the journal entry is you got to adjust BTC right for the for the cost basis and say so you got BTC 300 recognize a capital gain for 300 now I would not normally actually do a journal entry like that because it would actually look more like that which is a simplified version the only reason I split it up is because I'm telling you that there's a parallel thing going on at the same time so I was just trying to do that for visualization purposes so you would actually do the entry like this which is $2,000 for marketing services BTC because you're actually recording it as call spaces and then the other equation it would net to this and be the same thing anyway capital grain for 300 so that's a simplified journal entry right there and again this is also keeping track of the in so-called inventory of the Bitcoin that's happening so you can make you know so you can perform these calculations so this would be a memo entry this wouldn't be in the accounting records this will be like on a side ledger to, to track it right think of it an inventory tracking mechanism so again you got the you got the point uh, four three five was the you know that was the debate that was the amount of Bitcoin you got paid that was worth the five thousand dollars at the time. Okay, then uh, you know it was like two weeks later, so the price of Bitcoin went up, and two thousand dollars worth is point one four eight Bitcoin, but the basis of that was actually seventeen hundred. So you're actually left with point two eight seven Bitcoin is what's remaining in your Bitcoin inventory, if you will, and the current BTC value of that is three eight eight three. The Bitcoin basis is 3,300, right? So you got like there's actually three three things being accounted for, right, and tracked right there, right? So you can see what I'm talking about. How this can be complex. Now a lot of times you might not even see this because it's happening with software and stuff like that. But it's important to get the what is happening with the fundamentals. So um, now what you would have here is right now you've got uh, the difference between 3,883 and 3,300. That's 583 dollars. So as of right now, you have a $583, excuse me, $583 unrealized gain. So you actually had the $300 in a previous example. That was a realized gain that you would have to report for tax purposes. But right now you have an unrealized gain because you haven't sold it yet. It's just what if you did sell it today at this moment, you know, as far as the example goes, you would have a $583 gain. But because you haven't sold it, it's an unrealized gain. So you have realized gains and then you have unrealized gains. For tax purposes, you don't, you only report realized gains, things that actually happen, but for financial reporting, you may have a section where you report the unrealized gains, because if you had a thousand dollar basis in your Bitcoin or other crypto that's now worth ten times that, your financial statements would be misleading because you actually have a whole lot more value there, right? You got ten times the value. It wouldn't present the, you know, economic uh, situation at that point in time. So that's just a little thing on unrealized gains and realized gains. So, um, so before I forget this, I just want to say so to further demystify, like you hear balance sheet and income statement. So all the balance sheet is is simply a snapshot at a single point in time like that. Think of it as a second, like right now, bam, what's your uh, enterprise doing right now? It's a snapshot at that one second in time, whereas a profit and loss are an income statement. That represents what's happened over a period of time. So, like, for instance, profit and loss would be, you know, typically over a year, where the balance sheet is just a snapshot of that one moment in time at the end of a period, or any other, you know, day for that matter. So that's really the difference between those two. Now, this, this is not really, uh, this is just for illustration purposes. So, for example, if you were using Bitcoin as your reporting currency so that you created financial statements using Bitcoin, or tax returns using Bitcoin, this is what it would look like. But this is nonsensical because we don't do that. But this is just for illustration purposes. The entry would be marketing, you know, as an expense. BTC goes out to buy the marketing. So, um, and there would be no gain and loss on this, the same as if it was USD, because you're simply, you know, you're simply just using the Bitcoin to pay out. You would actually not even have a gain and loss. But this is not 
in reality, what actually happens, I was just doing this for illustration purposes. So transfers, this is a good one here. Everybody wants to ignore transfers. It seems to me. Why? Because transfers are not taxable. So everybody says, well, why do I need to consider them for tax purposes? My assertion is that they're actually the most important thing to consider for tax purposes in accounting. But many of the, uh, the 1.0 softwares of the world have actually discounted transfers and you may be able to put them in there, but um, basically, essentially, the system was designed from the beginning like, oh, tran transfers don't matter, right? They're not relevant, which is, I'm saying the opposite is the true. It's probably the most important transaction when you're troubleshooting and trying to, you know, get complete accounting. So a transfer is really something that happens from uh, between two or more wallets. I'm just going to say two wallets, but it could be more. Two or more wallets that you control, because you could essentially say, well, isn't every transaction a transfer? Every time you send Bitcoin to another address, well, yeah, it is, but that's not this definition. This definition, transfer, means it's from a wallet that you control to another wallet that you control, or from a wallet to an exchange, because you're going from cold storage to the exchange to make a trade. So transfers basically come in pairs. So if you actually had a list of transfers that you thought was your complete transfer list, and you counted them up and you had an odd number, you would know that something's missing. It doesn't mean one transaction's missing. It could be more than that, but what you know is it's not complete. Because since transfers come in pairs, if you add them up, you should have an even number of transfers and total transactions. So the thing is, there's no effect on the balance sheet or the profit and loss because it's not taxable, which is why people want to exclude it and say it's not important. Now, when I say there's no effect on the balance sheet, what I'm talking about is if you were reporting it and you had one line item that was cash and another line item that said crypto assets, like all in one bucket is one number, it doesn't change that. But yes, if you are trying to track and you actually have in your accounting system like you know, 10 wallets and exchanges in the balances. Yes, you would see one balance go up and another balance go down, but I'm not talking about that. Essentially, there's no impact on the balance sheet or the profit and loss because you're just moving stuff around. You just moved it from here to there, right? That's all you did. That's what a transfer is. So Bob, in this case, owns two entities, XYZ, and he also owns uh, JKL. He's a 100% he's owner in those two organizations, right? So here, in this case, what's in red would be a commingling violation. So these are all transfers, except in the case of where they're red, they would be an intercompany transfer because it's between one entity and another. So transfers, the transfers in black are okay. The ones in red are gonna create more work and it's gonna create a nightmare. So commingling is already a nightmare. It's, commingling is already a violation in accounting. Forget about crypto. Normally, commingling is a violation. Commingling is also a common occurrence because Typically, someone, you know, you have a, whether it's a small business owner or even, you know, any business owner for that matter, even if you're diligent about not, you know, not cross-pollinating your transactions, what happens is inevitably whether a credit card doesn't work and you got to go to another one or whatever. There's a number of reasons why you would have, you know, I'm going to say commingling. They're legitimate. But, um, you know, you don't want it to go wild and crazy. But if you even, if you do have commingling in the fiat world, so you just have these, this phenomenon happen, and you're just using USD, it's actually not that much of an issue because you can record it. It's just to create a transfer means you gotta create, record the transfer on the books over here, transfer on the books over here, you gotta reconcile it too, so it's actually four times the work. But it's doable. If you come in on crypto, it can create a nightmare because you can't really necessarily cherry pick the transactions back out. It's like you just dumped in an ingredient into a big saucepan and it's all mixed together now. You can't go backwards and back out the ingredient because it's mixed together, like that's what commingling is. So commingling is a major, major violation. It already exists, but it's, even some, it's something you want to stay away from because it can create all kinds of nightmares and problems in the crypto universe. So here's this, uh, another crypto transfer example. So this made up, again, you're transferring from your MyEther wallet, 2.642 uh, ETH. You're sending it to Bittrex, an exchange, because you want to do some trading with it. So that's simply a transfer. Now, what happens with typically with the tax software, as I said, what's the principle? You have to, at the time of a transaction, you make a USD, tra USD translation. So you say, well, what's the problem? You said that's what the principle was. That's what you're supposed to do, right? At the date time, date of the transaction, you do a USD translation, which in this example will be 534.87. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is it should actually be done at cost basis in this particular case, not a fair market value, because again, it's a transaction that doesn't really do anything. It's a neutral transaction. It doesn't affect the balance sheet. So it should really be transferred at cost, which is 439.35.
But the issue is that this, there's system limitations that don't really allow you to do that right now. And again, we're getting much, much better. We're going to have two, there's amazing, amazing stuff that's coming out on the scene. It's going to solve lots of this stuff. And that's, you know, that's going to be great. But this is a, a typical problem just to, to look out for. So, um, so again, they should be done at cost. And I'm saying this is a system limitation. But the reason it's a problem is because you have one wallet is overstated and the other wallet is understated, right? By, in this case, the difference between those two is 95.52. So another way to think about it is, just think of a one transaction world where you just created a brand new wallet, you sent 1,000 Bitcoin in there, okay? You deposited $1,000 of Bitcoin. Now, 30 days later, Bitcoin's now doubled, so it's now worth $2,000, all right? So now you, sent Bitcoin in for 1,000, it's now worth 2,000, you transfer it out, the system does a translation for $2,000, you record that in your counting system, what's the balance in that wallet? Anybody know what the balance of that wallet would be? You put 1,000 in, did the translation for two, you sent 2,000 back out, so you started with zero, you ended with zero, you put 1,000 in, recorded 2,000 back out. Anybody know what the balance of that wallet's gonna show? Negative 1,000, exactly negative 1,000, but what's the real balance? Zero, because you can never have a negative balance in crypto, which is beautiful, that's another beautiful thing. So it's gonna be understated, but the other wallet's gonna be overstated by 1,000, so it's easy to see it like in a one transaction world. So this is a major issue here with, with transfers. So if somebody just asked me, oh hey Kirk, uh, I heard you say that, you said the business accounting is much more complicated, and then without even thinking about it, like right off the cuff, if I just had to make up, this is what I would come up with. To me, business accounting is five or 10 times more complicated than an individual, right? So I'd, my analogy would be like, you know, it's the difference between major league baseball, business accounting, and little league baseball, which is individual accounting. You got a whole nother game to play. Um, all right, well, let's just go, we'll pick up that in a second, but um, so the three functions of money, I'm sure you guys, if you haven't already seen this in other crypto talks, because it's talked about a lot, and I'm sure if you're here for the whole conference, you're going to see people talk about this over and over again, but just always like to talk about it because you have medium of exchange, we already know, because we use U.S. dollars to buy and sell stuff and all that. We already know that function. Soar value, we think about maybe that is more as in gold, but you know the whole dialogue about, uh, you know, Bitcoin is digital gold and stuff like that. And it's actually a poor unit of account, which is why the, actually the U.S. dollar actually does have value in the sense that it is the unit of account that Bitcoin piggybacks on because when you do that translation for reporting purposes, that provides the unit of account value. You would never have an asset that's going to be, you know, 100% great in all these categories. You're going to have some that are good in some of those categories and not others. So Bitcoin is great medium of exchange, great store of value. It's actually a poor unit of account. But the point here is that Cryptocurrency is many things at the same time. It's like a shape-shifting kind of a thing. It can be a medium of exchange, a store of value. It can be a utility, an access, a governance, and on and on and on. It can be all these things. And then is it a security? Is it this? Is it that? So it's shape-shifting, which you know, kind of adds to the complicated nature of it, which I think is great because I, I love the fact that it can be multiple properties at the same time. Sometimes in one context, it could be multiple properties. In another context, it could be multiple properties, but those are different than the multiple properties over here. So back to the business thing. So really, I look at it when uh, business is, business is essentially engaged in two types of crypto activity, which is a portfolio play. I just kind of made that up, you know, portfolio. I don't see anybody using that type of language, but portfolio play, which it relates to the store value function of money, right? So you basically, you have, you know, you have crypto and you're kind of holding it as an asset for appreciation purposes, store value purposes, and so on. But you also have the operating play, which is like the medium of exchange play function of money, which you're just using it for operating, meaning business operations. So receiving it as income, paying it for expenses, vendors, subcontractors, and so forth. So you kind of have these two parallel things going on there as well. And many times, some of the original systems not really designed to kind of handle those. So if you're just doing pure trading, it's actually easier, again, with 1.0 accounting systems to deal with it. But when you put in the operating side, you could have limitations and kind of a loss of metadata, if you will. Because a lot of times you got to make hops from, you, know, you got disparate systems where you got, you got your transactions, you try to get them in the tax software, and then you got to like export, reformat, import to an accounting system, and you know, a lot of that song and dance. So when you have disparate systems, that creates problems because they don't really talk to each other and then you end up with differences and then you gotta try to figure out what the differences are. 
So again, continuing with the business accounting distinction. So why is it five to X or 10 X more complicated? Because you have to record and present all transactions. So during a period for a year, however many transactions happen, you gotta capture all those transactions. That's complete work and a complete and ideal world. That's what you would do. And they also have to prepare financial statements, balance sheet and income statement. This made the distinction. Balance sheet snapshot at one moment in time, income statements over a period of time. You also have to prepare and file multiple tax returns and information returns and stuff like that. So individuals typically don't have to do all that stuff. I'm not saying there's like people out there that don't like handle their personal lives as a business, but it's very, very rare to find that. So really, individuals really only have to deal with their calculate their capital gains. It's a one-off exercise. Plug that into your tax return. You're done. Now, of course, you would as an individual want to know what your balances are and have accurate balances because you you want to rebalance your portfolio and stuff like that. You want accurate information, right? But that's from an internal perspective rather than a business also has external requirements, right? So it's that kind of external forces at play that really force you into making sure you have accurate records. So again, there's three types of ending balances you could have. Some of this we kind of talked to and looked at it from a different angle. So you've got a coin balance, for example, 28.87 BTC, and the USD cost basis of that is, again, this is a made-up example, $143,000. And the fair market value on that same date, let's just say it's 1231, is $296,000. So you've got a nice, nice appreciation there. So if you know number one, you actually can pretty much automatically get number three. That's actually pretty easy. But nonetheless, you do have three different balances you need to know. The real problem comes in when you don't know what number, two, number one or number two is. And you might say, well, how's that possible? But it is. You can get there very easily. You actually don't know what the coin balance is. You don't know what the USD balance is. But, but if you can know number one, at least you're like, whew, all right, we're halfway the way there. We got that. You know, and you can, uh, if you got number one, you know what number three is, and then you may be able to have to do other kinds of piecing the puzzle together or try to figure out what's a good representation for call spaces. So again, this is one of the big challenges. See, individuals don't have to go through this. They, they might want to do it for their own internal purposes to know exactly where they are, but they're not forced to by external compliance like you are with a business. So again, like I said, individuals basically only calculate and report capital gains. So they don't have the need to prepare financial statements. I'm saying generally speaking. They don't need to calculate ending balances, whether it's wallets or exchanges and so on. So here's other challenges. Uh, missing or lost transactions. That's a good one. So, well, how can that happen? Well, you could be a number of reasons. You actually had the data in a file and then you lost the file. It could be the platform actually no longer makes the data available. Some platforms don't archive it and after a certain passage of time, the data's gone. So that's a problem. So there's lots of ways you can end up missing or lost transactions. So then what do you have? You have a hole in your accounting records. Another challenge. How are you going to figure out what that hole is. You got unidentified transactions, which is another thing. So you got ones that are missing, and now you got ones that you have, but you don't know what they were for. You can't figure it out. Why? Because you had the passage of time. Maybe it's a transfer. Maybe it was for, uh, you know, an expense. I, I can't, I don't have any invoices. I don't have any emails. I can't go back and figure it out. I've been through all my records. I can't figure it out. So that stuff actually happens. The more, the longer the passage of time goes by, the more difficult it is to recreate stuff because a lot of times you got to go by memory and I'm baffled that, you know, in my, you know, my grading of in the crypto system for all systems, I'd say it kind of gets a D in this area. Like I'm just baffled how like a majority of systems, they only have a memo field. So it's like in the early days of technology development, it's like, okay, we know we're going to get there one day, but in the meantime, can you give me a breadcrumb trail so I can put a memo in there? And I, that's just how I see it as a majority of systems don't even have a memo field. So then if you didn't write it down or have some other, other way to track it at that moment in time, well, then you might end up with an unidentified transaction. Now, compare that to the fiat world. Basically, if you were a 100% fiat business, you could go back two years later, three years later, five years later, and essentially recreate financial statements very easily because you have bank statements, which give you beginning balance plus deposits minus withdrawals equals ending balance. That's how you account for anything, whether it's inventory or anything, beginning balance, but what happened in the middle? ending balance. Well, in crypto, you don't get that information because it's self-serve in nature anyway. So I think that's going to, I mean, I know there are some systems that do provide that, but that's kind of a one-off scenario. So you also have limitations of block explorers. So you may have some block explorers may allow you to download transactions and some may not. So Etherscan, for example, is one that's great because you can 
plug in an address and then you can you know, see all the transactions that happen at that particular address. So Block Explorer is a way, is like that, that's how you see the public ledger. We talk about the transparent nature of public blockchains. So for those of you who don't know that, you know, Block Explorer is a way for you to self-serve yourself any time of the day. You can go research on your own. It's like self-verification. But so Etherscan can download those. And then if it doesn't have a running balance, then you may be able to create a running balance from it. Some exchanges have running balances and some do not. Uh, so some block explorers where you need to know what those transactions are, then you can't even pull them down. It's almost impossible. Like it doesn't give you a running balance, so you can't download it, and it doesn't give you a running balance. It's like, how am I supposed to extract that unless I do it one by one manually? You see what I'm saying? So you got a lot of challenges with block explorers that way. So, uh, so just getting into best practices around this is transa transaction data that resides on exchanges. So you got a lot of tax software. You can say, okay, cool, the most popular exchanges, often there's an API or some way you can link it. So all your, trans all your transactions are wonderfully imported into the system and you think you're good to go. But wait, they often typically don't uh, import the deposits or withdrawals. Again, so now you have an incomplete picture. So you get the trading in there, but often deposits and withdrawals don't come in. And if you go to download these reports, so forget about the importing and the linking, if you just go to download the reports, Oftentimes they come in three. So download trading activity, maybe one report, deposits another, withdrawals another. So you gotta grab the deposits and withdrawals, manually get those into a system because you don't have a complete picture. Because deposits could be, this might not be best practices, but perhaps you get paid for services in Bitcoin and you have it go into an exchange. I wouldn't do that, but some people might do that. So the deposits might actually represent income that should have been recorded and therefore the basis so if you didn't get deposits in there, you might, when you go to click calculate, all of a sudden you got red, which is, you know, a negative balance. And you got to figure out, okay, well, how do I solve a negative balance? Well, perhaps you forgot about the deposits and withdrawals, and you got to get those in there. And again, part of deposits and withdrawals is which ones are the transfers and which ones are income or expense or some other transaction besides trading. So always grab all those reports, regardless of um, being able to link them up. So it's the same thing for wallets. So what I'm saying is, Another big takeaway is always download the raw transaction files from all of your platforms and save them in the raw format. Even if you have to you know, do a save as and reformat them for importing purposes somewhere, always download them in the raw format and archive them that way. That's why you got CYA, cover your ass, and you've got that backup data, right? They can always be used in some other fashion to recreate or whatever, but that's your primary data source and you don't want to alter it. It's always good to have it in the raw state and it's raw format. So same thing you would do with wallets, you would download all the, download your transactions from there. And that's just kind of a fundamental, you know, approach to take there. And this equally is important. And another takeaway is the file naming scheme, which again, this is not necessarily unique to crypto, a unique tip for crypto, because in the regular world, we all, regardless of what your occupation is, everybody deals with files all the time, right? Word, Excel, whatever it is, PDFs, everybody deals with files. It doesn't matter what type of work you do. So it's already important to have, I'm fanatical about file naming schemes, but it's even more important here because what you end up with is next thing you got a list of like CSV files that are like this long, trying to like manage some accounting, like, you know, and doing it on the side to link between, you know, to get it into your accounting system. So you end up with all these iterations of other files from the original raw file. And if you're looking at that, you would just pull your, you know, you'd lose your mind and pull your hair out. So you want to name them as what they are. So in this case, XYZ is the company, Bittrex is the exchange export could be raw format. I actually use raw sometimes, so I know it's actually the raw file, right? And then the date is critical. So using that, a naming scheme is super critical because many people just typically, they'll just save files by whatever the export name was, which is some name, yes? Oh, five minutes, okay. <laughs> All right, speed it up. So uh, screenshot, uh, this is another big one here, ending balances. You got to, what I would recommend is screenshotting ending balances so you can have a stake in the sand. Super, super critical. So when you get to the end of your period, if it's 1231, go into your exchanges, take a screenshot. Even if you say, oh, well, I know on that one I can export the report. It either gives me a balance or I can recalculate the balance. It doesn't matter because guess what? What you recalculate and what you show on the screen, they might be different. What explains that? Well, because not all exchanges actually do great accounting. Just because they're an exchange doesn't mean they have great accounting on the inside. So you want to have as many data points as you have so that at a later point in time you can reconstruct stuff. So critical, get that snapshot, those uh, ending balances. Um, 
So consistency is the key again, and one of the big places for consistency would be call spaces, because everybody know, wants to know what about call spaces do I use. So specific, specific identification, I say, is paramount to be able to have and use that, and, uh, and even other, uh, other call spaces methods as well, but FIFO has problems. I just want to go on this one real quick. This is what I call the double capital gains paradox, or I also call it the conduit problem. So this is basically where, so here's the facts. Bob bought 10 BTC for 300, so his basis is 3,000. It's now worth 105, right? So he wants to do crypto trading, and he's concerned about how this is going to impact his taxes. So he actually wants to sell 1,000 uh, Ethereum Classic, and he has a zero basis because it was from a chain split, one Ethereum chain split in 2016. He's got, and he wants to take some profits because guess what? When the rest of the crypto market was down, this is actually for real a couple days ago, Ethereum Classic went up like 26% in a day. It actually went up to seven something. I'm not sure what it is right now. So he's a man, I want to take some profits, right? So, and I'm using this as an example of zero basis because the highest possible gain you should be able to have should never be higher than the proceeds. So the highest gain has to equal the proceeds. It can never be, you should never be able to have a gain higher than $7,040 in this example, right? However, the way he does that, he needs to use Bitcoin as a conduit. And so what he does is he sells his Ethereum Classic on Bittrex for 0.7 BTC. He gets out of the deal. And then he sends it to Coinbase and sells it for 0.7 BTC, BTC, which is $7,000, right? Now, I understand some stuff you can sell. You could actually sell that and you wouldn't, in a way that you wouldn't have this, but this is illustration purposes. So moving on, what happened here? Uh, Bob's basis in the 7,000 Bitcoin he received is $210. Why? Because FIFO goes back to the oldest coins first, which had a $300 basis. So 0.7 times $300 because he had 10 of those Bitcoin, right? 0.7 times that is $210 basis. So now what does he have? He's got a long-term gain in Bitcoin of $6,790. You say, well, how'd that happen? All he was trying to do is use Bitcoin as a conduit to sell this other coin. His main intention was to go from X coin into USD. He just had to use Bitcoin to facilitate that. The gain, maximum gain here should be 7,040, but he actually has a gain of $13,000, which is like a double capital gain. So that is a problem with FIFO, and that's why I'm saying you gotta be able to use other methods. And I'm just gonna skip that one. So here's a, just to sum up like some of the stuff I'm talking, this is a blog that I wrote like three, three four years ago, and I actually modified and add some other stuff. But you can see that the number of transactions times the number of wallets or addresses times the number of cryptocurrencies times the number of commingled transactions, right? We talked about that nightmare. Times the number of missing transactions or other missing data, times the years of transactions or the length of time. Multiply all that together, square that. That gives you what your Bitcoin tax complexity is. Now there's no basis for this equation, but it's just to make up some representation of if you wanna say, how can I quantify the complexity of my particular situation? That's the way to kind of think of it metaphorically. Similarly, Jeremy Drain wrote an article called The Maddening Task of Calculating Taxes on Crypto, and that's the acronym for these 12 processes that you have here that you gotta go through. Find the data, isolate the data, so on and so on. So best practices, tips would be inventory all wallets, addresses, exchanges, also in a, a, uh, inter, uh, do an inventory of all your coins. Why? Because you could have uh, bought coins in an ICO that didn't take place on an exchange, so they're over here. Now it might seem trivial, because you say, hey, well, I only use Coinbase and Jax and, um, you know, Bittrex, and that's it. Why are you asking me to take an inventory? Because it doesn't take long to actually have your stuff spread out more all over the place, and actually, believe it or not, it can happen where you actually forget that you have coins somewhere on an exchange. This does happen. So you need to just take an inventory, go through a mental exercise. Okay, this is what I've used. This is what I got. Now, it might not be complete in the first shot, and as you go through and do your, you know, accounting, you might remember some other ones. But do an inventory first. We talked about downloading the CSV files for every exchange in raw format. File naming scheme is important. Uh, choose your Bitcoin tax software, which you may notice that was uh, talking about any software was not, you know, in part of today's talk because the point here was to talk about fundamentals and we wouldn't even have time to talk about it anyway. And it's, um, this is a neutral conversation, not trying to like compare, you know, tax software. This is like to give you the fundamentals to use. So review transactions code, you, know, you have to import all your transactions. Review the transactions and code as necessary. So just because you get transactions in there doesn't mean the magic wand has been waved and there's no more work to do. You gotta make sure they're coded properly. Troubleshoot, because you may have negative balances. By the way, you may not have a negative balance and think it's right, but there could have errors hidden. At least when you have a negative balance, you know you got some more, you know, you gotta go looking to see how to fix it. And of course, create tax reports, journal entries, and all that stuff, so. And there's the old logo, speaking of 
the new logo that they presented. And as Benjamin Franklin always says, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Thanks. <laughs>